In the last lecture, what I tried to do was demonstrate how Freud and those who came after him achieved a significant leap in the story that I'm telling of this rise of expressive individualism and psychologized selfhood, and that is the placing of sex and sexual desire at the very heart, not only of how we think of ourselves, but also at the heart of social and cultural dynamics. It's part of the way of explaining why, for example, the LGBTQ movement is today so prominent and powerful in our political imaginations and indeed in the political world in general. Sexual politics, revolutionary sexual politics, the sexual revolution, all point to the fact that sex and sexual desire have become potent forces, not simply at a personal level in society, but at national, political, and even international levels as well. And when we step aside from our cultural moment, where this is sort of the air that we breathe, when we step aside from our cultural moment and ask for a moment, how did this come about? It should strike us as rather odd. Why is it that the most private of human activities now is at the centre of the most public of political debates? Why is private sexual activity now such a matter of great public concern, not just in America, not just in Europe, but across the world as a whole. Well, in order to explain this, we need to go back to an unlikely and somewhat, for most of us, obscure problem at this point. And that is the failure of classical Marxism in the early 20th century might sound a bit odd because the 20th century, of course, was dominated in some ways by the Soviet Union and, to a lesser extent, China. Many of the great political stories of the certainly the middle, early and middle 20th century seem to be the triumph of Marxism. So how can I talk here about the failure of Marxism as providing the key to the way politics and political theory has developed in more recent years? Well, the problem was this. It was twofold. The problem involved both the success of Marxism and the failure of Marxism. The success of Marxism, when we look, for example, at the Russian Revolution that strikes us as, well, that seems to be a pretty powerful Marxist movement. For most Marxists at the time, it would have been odd because Russia did not have that most important of things that was necessary for bringing about the revolution. It did not have a developed industrial working class. It was really a peasant-based virtually a feudal society. Marx's theory was, of course, that capitalism would develop to such a point that the industrial working class would be squeezed to the point where they would explode in revolution. So why did it happen in a country where there was no developed industrial working class? More than that, why did it not happen in a place like Germany? After the end of the First World War, there was a so-called Spartacist uprising, an attempt to establish a Soviet-style regime in Germany, and it failed. Why did it fail in Germany when Germany had a highly developed industrial working class? That was a question that perplexed the Marxists. More than that, more than that, think about other revolutions that were taking place. 1905. There had been a revolution in Russia that had failed. Soldiers had, only, had overthrown their oppressors only to reinstate them again. Why? And why in the 1920s were the working classes moving to back fascism and Nazism rather than communism and Marxism? Marx, the writings of Marx, really offered no explanation for this phenomenon. Marx just assumed, if you like, that the working class would develop and would develop a revolutionary self-consciousness. He never explained how that was to happen. And that left what we might call a psychological void or gap within Marxist theory that later Marxist theorists, particularly those in the middle years of the decades of the 20th century, were to fill. And they were to fill it by borrowing ideas from guess who? Sigmund Freud. Central figure in this story was the man I mentioned at the very end of last lecture, Wilhelm Reich. Somewhat younger than Freud, he was born in 1897. He didn't die in London like Freud did. He was an Austrian like Freud, but he didn't die in London like Freud did. He died in Pennsylvania, would you believe? 
not too far from where I'm giving this lecture. He died in Pennsylvania uh, uh, in prison on fraud charges for selling some weird machine. But his significance doesn't lie in the weird machine and the strange UFO stories and fables that he came to believe in and advocate in later life. His significance lies in the way that he helped to fuse Marxism and Freudianism in the 1920s and 1930s in a way that becomes extremely potent in the 1960s onwards with the so-called sexual revolution. He'd been a junior colleague of Freud in Vienna at one point, but even Freud regarded Reich as too extreme. So how and what does Reich do relative to Freud? Well, Reich makes a key move with Freud's theories that will make Freud very useful to Marxists. I'm going to read you a quotation here from his early work, The Mass Psychology of Fascism. He says this, It becomes apparent that it is not cultural activity itself which demands suppression and repression of sexuality, but only the present forms of this activity. And so one is willing to sacrifice these forms if by so doing the terrible wretchedness of children could be eliminated. What does Reich mean in that little statement? Well, he's accepting Freud's basic point about the trade-off we talked about last lecture of sexual satisfaction for civilization. But he's giving a distinctive Marxist twist. Remember what I said about Marx a few lectures ago, that for Marx, moral codes were, if you like, uh, a, a sneaky way of the ruling class giving its own values transcendence and using those values to keep people down, to keep the oppressed down. Well, what Reich is doing here is he's applying Marx to the idea and saying, yeah, Freud's right that the key to civilization is, if you like, sexual repression. But we need to refract that through a Marxist lens and realize that the specific forms of sexual repression, the specific forms of the moral codes we all deal with, they're actually specific to the class struggle. They're specific to the point in time at which they come. Good example would be, for uh, would be monogamous heterosexual marriage. Reich would look at that and say, you know, monogamous heterosexual marriage well, Freud would say about it, you know, that's the trade-off for civilization. Reich would say, no, that's a trade-off for bourgeois capitalist civilization. The family, the, uh, the nuclear family, the monogamous heterosexual relationship, that serves the interest of the factory owners who want a stable workforce that isn't threatening them. More to the point, Reich would say what that does, of course, is it instantiates the authority of the father figure at an early date. So if you ask Wilhelm Reich, if he was here today, and I would say, Dr. Reich, why is it that in 1905 the soldiers in Russia overthrow their masters and only, uh, only, uh, only to reinstate them sometimes later? Reich would say, that's because of the nuclear family. They were brought up to respect the father figure. And we all know that teenagers can rebel against their fathers, but they feel guilty for doing so. And sooner or later, they reinstate the father as an authoritative figure within their lives. And he'd say, what we see in families, it's kind of a training ground for obedience within society. The czar is like the great father figure. And yes, they challenge the authority of the czar like a teenager might challenge the authority of his father. But ultimately, the teenager will fall into line. So this is how Reich takes Freud and makes him specifically political, if you like. As I said, talking about the family, I've got this quotation here that, uh, that Reich makes uh, about the family. Again, this is from his mass psychology of fascism. He's seeing the family as the source of fascism. What is fascism? It's the worship of the great leader, the great father figure. He says this, the interlacing of the socio-economic structure with the sexual structure of society and the structural reproduction of society take place in the first four or five years and in the authoritarian family. The church only continues this function later. Thus the authoritarian state gains an enormous interest in the authoritarian family. It becomes the factory in which the state structure and ideology are molded. 
You want to know why people are fascists, right? It's going to say it's because of the authoritarian family. And as kids grow up, they pass from the family to the church that reinforces uh, this idea as well. All of these institutions, family and church, they're designed to repress the individual and make them obedient members of society. Reich, of course, at this point, stands in a hallowed line of critics of the family. I could have told the story I've told using the characters I've called upon. I could have told it as a story of criticism of the family. Rousseau sends his children to an orphanage. What more of a slap against the family could one think of in practical terms? The great romantics. Many of them didn't like the family. Shelley, Percy Bysshe Shelley, saw it as enforcing an unnatural monogamy. William Blake, the great romantic poet, saw the family as a bar to free love and therefore to human freedom. Marx's sidekick, Friedrich Engels, he was the one who said, you know, the family, that's the essential unit for bourgeois middle class uh, society. So for Reich then, he stands in a hallowed line of critics of the family, but his criticism takes a very distinctive ideological form as he draws upon Freud and uses him to reinforce the Marxist criticism of society. He says this, then talking about morality. Morality's aim, he says, is to produce acquiescent subjects who despite distress and humiliation are adjusted to the authoritarian order. Thus the family is the authoritarian state in miniature to which the child must learn to adapt himself as a preparation for the general social adjustment required of him later. Most of us, most of us would think of the families as, yeah, that's where we prepare our children to be adults. The task of a parent is to prepare their child to make their own way in the world. The task of a family is to teach them that this kind of behavior is not acceptable. You're going to get into trouble if you behave like that outside. This kind of behavior, this is the sort of behavior you need to model. Mothers and fathers try to be role models for their kids to show them how they can move into society and be part of civilization. Reich would say, I don't dispute that. I don't dispute that. But you are merely tools in doing that of bourgeois society. What you are doing is you are producing, in his own words, acquiescent subjects who will put up with all kinds of distress and grief because you have taught them that that is what they are supposed to do. So Reich is the man then. He's bringing Freud into Marx, and he's using Freud to help explain some of the psychological underpinnings of society that fill in gaps in Marxist theory. Why is fascism attractive to the working classes? Because they've had the bourgeois model of the family imposed upon them and have become again, to use his term, acquiescent subjects who despite distress and humiliation are adjusted to the authoritarian order. And as they leave the home, they look for the great father figure, the Fuhrer, the Duce, the great leader, to supplant, to replace that which they have left behind. That brings me to Reich's greatest and perhaps his most significant work, The Sexual Revolution. It was written in 1936, but if you read it today, you're thinking he's writing in the 1960s. It was 30 years before his ideas gained major political currency and became part of the rallying cry of the rebellions and revolutions in the student world in 1968. But he wrote it in 1936. And in this work, he makes the point that Freud was correct in seeing the role sexual repression had as the basis of civilization but incorrect in seeing the sexual codes of his own day, if you like, as being of universal validity. What Reich wanted to do, as I said earlier in this lecture, was sort of historicize Freud through the lens of Marx. Societies built around the patriarchal family had particular political and social interests, not simply living together in a civilized way, but living together in a civilized way in a particular form, at the heart of which was the nuclear patriarchal family. Therefore, therefore, and here Reich makes the sort of the next 
necessary move. Just remember, Marx was the one who made the point that philosophers merely describe the world. The point of philosophy really is to change the world. Reich makes the Marxist move to transform the world at this point by saying that if sexual codes are a tool by which the oppressors oppress, then at the heart of the political revolution has to be the dismantling of those very sexual codes. Here he says this in the sexual revolution. The free society will provide ample room and security for the gratification of natural needs. Thus, it will not only not prohibit a love relationship between two adolescents of the opposite sex, but will give it all manner of social support. Such a society will probably conclude that any adult who hinders the development of the child's sexuality should be severely dealt with. Let me repeat that last line. Such a society will probably conclude that any adult who hinders the development of the child's sexuality, should be severely dealt with. What a prophecy of the day in which we live. Think about all the debates that go on about uh, sexual education in school, whether the parents have the right to give their kids sex education, or whether it should be handed over to the state. Reich is saying here, if you like, it's too important to give to the parents. Because the parents, the game of the parents is to produce acquiescent subjects. The parents actually should be severely dealt with, he says, if they stand in the way of the kind of liberating sexual education that he himself envisages. He goes on, social concepts of the 19th century, which were defined purely in economic terms, no longer fit the ideological stratifications in the cultural struggles of the 20th century. In its simplest formulation, Today's social struggles are being waged between those forces interested in the safeguarding and affirming of life and those whose interests lie in its destruction and negation. What does he mean there? He's really saying, you know, go back to the 19th century and talk about oppression. And probably people are going to think about oppression in economic terms. Again, to refer to my late great-grandfather. So he died 25 years ago. Ordinary working man sheet metal worker in the industrial heartland of England in the middle decades of the 20th century. If I'd asked my grandfather, what's oppression, granddad? What does oppression look like? I think he'd have said, oppression is not getting an honest day's pay for an honest day's work. Oppression, and I actually remember him telling me this story, oppression is walking down a street in the 1930s looking for work and knowing that there's no work to be had. Think about what my granddad would have been saying there. He's essentially saying oppression is an economic thing. Remember I said that his view of job satisfaction would be he could put bread on the table and shoes on his children's feet and he had the dignity of labour. Well, oppression means that which stops him from doing that. Now think about oppression as it's often thought of today. Oppression is very psychological today, isn't it? It's referring to somebody with the wrong word or the wrong epithet. It's not allowing them to be openly and publicly that which they think they are inside. It's psychological. Oppression has shifted from being economic to being psychological. That's what Reich's saying in the 1930s. Here he's saying, you know, that old economic view of oppression, it doesn't work anymore. We need to think of oppression much more intellectually, ideologically, psychologically. Oppression is teaching kids oppressive sexual codes that prevent them from fulfilling their desires and prevent them from being who they really are inside. The great Italian philosopher Augusto del Noce draws the obvious conclusion from all this. He says, it is clear that what today is called the left fights less and less in terms of class warfare and more and more in terms of warfare against repression claiming that the struggle for the economic progress of the disadvantaged is included in this more general struggle, as if the two were inseparable. What Del Noce, who was a conservative philosopher, he's a critic of uh, Reich and of uh, the sort of the neo-Marxism that Reich represents. What Del Noce is saying there is the left now fights on the basis of psychological oppression because it sees the, the codes, 
the moral codes that make people behave in certain ways as repressive of who they are. And if you want to achieve justice in society, the left says, you need to demolish those codes. That, of course, is why there is such heat about the LGBTQ movement, for example. What is going on there is not simply uh, a, a fight for somebody to be able to express who they are, who they feel they are in the public realm. It's seen as a deeply political struggle because it's all about the way society represses certain feelings, certain desires, certain identities. And Reich is the man who makes that connection in his books in the 1930s, particularly the sexual revolution. So let's summarize this then. Freud, as I said last time, Freud is the man who really paves the way for us thinking of sex as who we are. It's not an activity anymore, it's an identity. My sexual desire fundamentally defines who I am. Reich picks up on this, but he says, you know, sexual codes as they currently exist are designed to maintain the current oppressive structure of society. Therefore, political freedom is the same as sexual freedom. And the struggle for political freedom is inseparable from, and in fact, perhaps needs to be prosecuted through the idiom of the struggle for sexual freedom. To end with a quotation from Reich, the existence of strict moral principles has invariably signified that the biological and specifically the sexual needs of man were not being satisfied. Every moral regulation is in itself sex negating and all compulsory morality is life negating. The social revolution has no more important task than finally to enable human beings to realize their full potentialities and find gratification in life. For Reich, therefore, the political revolution is inevitably the sexual revolution. And that's why the debates today aren't simply about legitimate forms of behavior. Where do we draw the bounds on legitimate forms of behavior? They're actually about who we think people really are and how we conceptualize the very notion of what it means to be a free human being. And it's some of the manifestations of that that I want to reflect on briefly in the eighth and final lecture.